pictures to strive toward. Paul is hoping to show, not just to tell, what it means to be a mature disciple of Jesus. And so in these 16 verses of chapter 4, he gives three practical fruits of a maturing faith. First, he says that those who are mature and are maturing in their faith, he says that they get along. They get along. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul is saying that mature Christians don't come along and strive to get in a fight with everybody. He says maturity in the faith is humble and teachable. It looks like gentleness rather than constantly making war. It looks like patience. It means bearing with one another. And it means having an eagerness to maintain unity and peace among God's people where possible. Here's a couple things we can notice right off the bat about this. That maturity in your faith is primarily shown in your relationships with others. Something that what makes somebody mature in their faith is that they stand up in front of a bunch of people on Sundays. Or that they go up on a mountaintop somewhere, just them and Jesus, and never come down. Now, there's nothing wrong with going and getting alone with Jesus, right? But friends, none of that is going to matter if you don't live out the way Jesus would have you live with others. Yeah. The evidence that you're growing in a relationship with the Lord is how you live in relationship with others. Have you ever met those people who they love to talk about Jesus, but they're really just a jerk? <laughs> right? Everybody's got a person in mind right now. Paul's saying, don't be that person. They're not mature in their faith. Right? The two greatest commandments are intricately connected. Love God and love neighbor. Right? And so some think that maturity is simply gathering more knowledge. And yes, as you mature in your faith, you're going to gather more knowledge. But knowledge by itself puffs up love, builds up. Maturity in faith means talking what you've learned, and, but also putting it into practice in the way you live with others. Notice second, the context in which Paul speaks about his living out spiritual maturity is in the local church. Biblical Christianity sees the primary place of our Christian life as the local church. When you see the one another commands of Scripture, Paul had them have in mind real people who they knew, who they had life and community with. When it says bear with one another, the primary context is not obnoxious strangers on the Internet, though you should bear with those people. Rather, he has in mind the obnoxious person you can't unfollow or block. The one that you can't just hit a button and no longer hear from. No, he has in mind that there's going to sometimes be people who grind your gears. And spiritual maturity would require us to bear with that person in love and to do everything possible to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. A mature faith seeks to get along where possible. But when he talks about unity, he's not talking about sort of that warm, fuzzy feeling. You ever heard somebody say, well, we feel very unified. What does that mean, right? Ultimately, Unity is not a feeling, but the community of believers, the local church, pursues unity around certain truths. We're not pursuing a subjective feeling, but rather we're, we're unified together with truths we believe <coughs> and faith. Right? It's an outflowing of our shared commitments and convictions. Look at verse 4. That's what Paul begins to tell us. He says, there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. In these short verses, he talks about one seven times, seven different truths which were to unify. He says that God's people, our unity is primarily theological. It's shared beliefs that we're 
meant to live in light of. And the truths and the realities behind them. So let's just look at these real quick. He says first that we're one body. Back in chapter 2, he said that Jew and Gentile that were divided in the Ephesian church, they're no longer two different groups, but they're one body. The community of faith, we're no longer primarily defined by our differences, nor are we meant to divide by our differences, but unite around what we share, which is the truth of Jesus. He's created one new man in the place of many. He says we have one spirit. He said this throughout Ephesians, right? That now, through faith, anyone who trusts in Jesus is indwelt and filled with the Spirit of God. He says, for followers of Jesus, we all share the same hope. The same hope. And while Paul's primary concern is the local church, I think this is something that forms together our communion and our relationship and our unity with believers outside of our church. So let me tell you something that a couple of the other churches don't want you to know. When you get to heaven, there's not going to be a Methodist section and a Baptist Amen. section. Amen. Sorry. I don't know if I told you that. There's not going to be restricted seating. No, we share the same hope that belongs to our call. And this is part of the unity that we share as a local church, but also that we share with believers in, with other with believers in other churches. These are the truths that form our unity. And it also begins to form what, where we build fences, where we might divide. Think about this. He says we have one Lord. And that's why we need to understand who God is. It's important that we understand things like the Trinity and the person of Christ. And we make sure that we share unity together with folks who believe in the same Lord that we do. There are churches that we cannot possibly have unity with. There are groups that might call themselves Christians but deny who Jesus is. So we can't be in the same unity with them that we have with other believers. We have one Lord. He says we have one faith. One set of essential doctrines that we are to believe. And St. Augustine would famously say, In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. So we're to be unified together around that we confess that Jesus is Lord. And then he says they're connected with one baptism. All the Ephesians were baptized into the same body. They shared one baptism together. And then he culminates one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. In Jesus we are one family. We have one Father and our Heavenly Father doesn't play favorites. Right. And in Jesus, we're going to spend eternity together, so we need to get our unity right here and now. You know that person that bugs you, but you know they are genuinely following Jesus? you got a long time to spend with them. I get it figured out now, right? And maturity in faith is knowing these truths and living them out in our life. Maturity in faith means we get along with other believers in the body, and we seek to get along with other believers who worship at different local Churches. So let me give you some practical steps of what this looks like. First, this means that we as believers should seek to resolve conflict in a biblical way. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 18, says that in the church, when there are conflicts, that the people who are involved should deal with it themselves. That brothers should go to brother and seek repentance, restitution, and peace. And then he says, hey, if that doesn't work, then they bring in a small group who can be objective and consider the conflict from both sides. Remember, the goal is peace, not winning the war. And then if a small group can't handle it, he says, only then could it maybe overflow to a wider body. Spiritual maturity would teach us that we need to be willing to go to other people who we have concerns or conflicts with and to deal, it, and to deal with them face to face. <coughs> But those who are impacted. Spiritual immaturity would have us be passive about these things, would have us solve things through gossip. And friends, spiritual immaturity would deal with all this on Facebook. God's will is that we get along together. 
Here's a second application. Getting along means we need to be aware of how we speak about our brothers and our sisters in other churches that aren't our church. Think about it this way. We need to be very mindful about how we speak about people in the immediate family. That's those that are a part of our body. But also we need to be very careful about how we speak about those who are part of the extended family. We need to be very careful because I think we have a tendency to think that the kingdom of God in our town begins and ends right here. I think we're tempted to think that the kingdom of God only begins and ends with churches that share some of our theological commitments. Friends, let me tell you, incredible work is happening at the churches in and around our community. And it's not a competition. Amen. But rather, friends, we seek where possible and where a unity can be found to celebrate what's happening in the family. And this finally should impact our mission. Did you know the mission of our church is not to be sheep swappers? Right? People often go, well, we're not the biggest church in town. We must be doing something wrong. No, oh, believe me, there are some big churches that have big problems. Right? Because when you gather all the people that left their other church for being disgruntled, it's only a matter of time before they become disgruntled with you. Right? Friends, let me tell you something. We are not in competition. We should mourn and pray for other churches in our community when they have conflict or when they divide or when they have problems. In fact, I think we should begin to pray by name for God's success in other churches that aren't our own. Friends, the mission is simply too great for us to accomplish on our own. Right? Friends, 77% of our county right now are disconnected from church and likely disconnected from Christ. And friends, a rising tide lifts all ships. We need a variety of churches with a variety of expressions of the body of Christ in order to accomplish this mission. We've had people show up here and they've visited. And you know what? They've come to me and went, it's not my thing. And you know what? We've encouraged them to go down the road and get plugged into other churches. And many of them did. And they're a blessing where they are. That's great. So let me encourage you this week. Write down a church in our community. I'd even encourage you to do it for one that's maybe not, uh, not similar to us in certain ways. And to pray for them <coughs> this week. In fact, even think about We've got several churches in our community. I can think of six offhand who don't have pastors right now. What a difficult place for them to be in. Think about Katie's Methodist. Think about Katie's Baptist. Oak Grove. Word of Hope. One church, Emmanuel, right across the 68, there are many other churches who, who preach Jesus. They're not compromising on who Jesus is, but they look a little different than we do. Friends, maturity in faith, when lived out as a church, means that, friends, we're not in competition, but rather we share commitment to the health of our family and to the expansion of the kingdom of God. Friends, when you're maturing in your faith, it means you're going to get along with others. But Paul quickly takes a turn from unity to a discussion of diversity. Look at verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So we turn from the big picture of unity, and he focuses in on individual diversity. Specifically, he points out that by grace, God has given each and every one of us gifts, talents, skills, According to the measure of Christ's gift to use in the body. So mature believers, friends, we're going to get along. But second, we're also going to get involved. We're going to get involved. Again, see the background here is the local church. The believers use their gifts to serve others in and around the body of Christ. And let me tell you, if you read the New Testament, there was a lot of debate around the spiritual gifts in the early church. Right? The Corinthians were having this big fight because they thought people with certain gifts were more important than others. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, as we see, but he also wrote to the Romans about this topic. Peter, the Apostle Peter, wrote about spiritual gifts in his first letter. So I think this could be a source of tension at times. Because there are folks who are tempted to believe that God has gifted them greatly, therefore they're more important than other believers in the body. And there are those who have certain gifts 
But then they begin to play the comparison game. Well, I'm not as important as they are. I'm not doing this like they are. And Paul here in Ephesians 4 wants to correct that. Grace has been given to each according to the measure of Christ's gift. In other words, friends, if you have a spiritual gift, it is God who gave you that gift. Thus, you should not discount it. Friends, and that means not, and that also means that the gifts he's given us were meant to cultivate, to put into practice, to improve them. God has wired us and empowered us, so we need to steward that in order to make an impact through the body of Christ. Let me illustrate it this way. Let me illustrate it this way. There are certain things that I can practice and practice and practice that I will never be able to do. For instance, I can practice and practice and practice all day long. I'm not playing for the NBA. God did not give me the gift of height nor the gift of lift, right? But, friends, our senior pastor, which is Jesus, by the way, he has given gifts to our body to use and to cultivate and to grow. And in fact, notice what Paul says in verse 8. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high... He led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Here he is quoting from Psalm 68. Then he explains what his point is in verse 9. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he descended in the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Here he takes a section of Psalm 68 which is about Moses ascending the mountain to Sinai, and he applies it to Jesus. And it's like Jesus came, and he descended to come and live among us as a man. Then he ascended into heaven, and he's the one who gives gifts to every single believer. So we should recognize that the one who gives us our spiritual gifts knows what it's like to walk on earth with us. He is sympathetic to our weakness. But he's also got the vantage point now dwelling in heaven far above and beyond us. He can have both sympathy and supremacy, and he is the one who gives gifts to you in the church according to his wisdom and his grace. So let me just remind you that, friends, there are no small gifts if they've been given by Jesus. That however he's wired you and the Spirit has empowered you, he has a purpose and a role for you in the local church. And it doesn't mean that you've got to stand up in front of a bunch of people. In fact, some of those impactful gifts are used in the quiet where only God can see you serve him. God gives gifts to his church and God is giving gifts to each and every one of us to serve the church. In fact, Paul just gives a brief list in verse 11. Of a handful, this isn't exhaustive, but a handful of gifts that he wants to talk to the Ephesians about. He says, verse 11, and the risen Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. So here he gives a list of gifts that brought with them particular roles in the body. He says, apostleship, this is a gift that Paul himself had. These are those who saw the risen Christ and were commissioned by Christ to be witnesses and to have a very unique ministry. Despite what the TV preacher might tell you, there are no living apostles today. They're not running around, right? If you look back at chapter 2, verse 20, we see the apostles and the prophets were foundational to the role of the church. Ephesians 3, 5 says that the apostles and prophets were given in order to reveal scripture to his people. These were gifts and positions reserved for the founding of the church, and they still have influence because we're still studying their words today. And so Paul says, hey, consider that God is the one who gave the apostles and the prophets. Then he speaks about the evangelists. These are likely those who are sharing the gospel and serving a family of local churches. You might think of this as somebody who's sent out as a missionary or someone who a group of churches go together to fund in order that that person might serve their churches. You can think about what happens through the Little River family of churches that we're a part of. Our churches pull money together in order to do ministry together and to fund folks there who serve and strengthen our churches. 
You can think of the way as a ministry that somewhat does this where our churches support in order that, that they might be come alongside our churches and reaching the youth and strengthening the found alongside the ministry of the local church, not in place of it. And then, depending on your translation, you may see shepherds, comma, and teachers, or as the ESV has it, the shepherds and the teachers without the comma. There's a debate about, is this two different roles? Is it one role? I'm not really sure. That's a huge debate to settle today about where a comma needs to go. But it's ultimately speaking of pastors, of what 1 Timothy 5 calls elders, and what 1 Timothy 3 calls overseers in a local body. God gives and calls men to serve particular churches for a particular purpose. And here's why he's telling us all this. He says, why in the world does God give these high-level gifts, these leadership gifts, these offices, these particular positions in the church? Verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So why does God give leadership to his church, not that they might do all the ministry, but that they might equip the saints to do the work of ministry. We get it backwards. We get a young man who wants to go off, and we go, man, he's been called to ministry, and we send him off to seminary. No, friends, hear me. He might have been called to a particular kind of ministry, but if you are a Christian, you have been called to ministry. And the role of leadership in the body of Christ is to equip the saints for that work, to come alongside the saints in that role. And so all this to say maturity in the body means getting involved in the life of the local church. It means finding a place to use your gifts. And this doesn't have to look like starting another program. Churches are so bad about, well, we see a need, we've got to start a program to solve it. No, friends, God's plan for the world is not programs, it's people. Did you know that if there's a homebound person who's not getting visited, you can call them and visit them without having to make a program to do it? Amen. Friends, there are ways to go and reach out to someone that's having a hard time and seek to encourage them. Friends, God may have given you the gift of being able to grill a burger so you can have some people over who just need someone to listen. Maybe, friends, God would be have you use your gifts of hospitality to invite a small group of believers into your home regularly just to spend life together. Maybe God has given you gifts to serve and reach the lost in your, influ in, in your sphere of influence. Let me tell you, there's a man who comes and serves at the way. He plays chess and reaches these students through playing chess. Friends, God is giving you gifts so everyone who is a follower of Christ has a role to play in the church of Christ. Just consider, for instance, the list of roles Paul highlights here. The apostles and prophets, they serve the church by giving us the word that we study and proclaim. The evangelists serve us by devoting themselves to the spread of that word and by training others in the way to share the word. Pastors serve the church through weekly teaching God's word, particularly what it means and how to apply it so that it might be modeled for others. Notice his whole point here is that all of us might be able to speak the truth and walk in love. Now, let me tell you something. Did you know in 1 Timothy chapter 3, that's a passage of scripture where they get the qualifications for pastors and deacons, for leadership in the church. And, and I've read through there several times. It doesn't say the man needs a Master of Divinity degree, though that's not a bad thing to have. But friends, it says that the, that the, that the leadership in the church, one, the only skill it lists is that they must be able to teach. That doesn't mean they've got to be the best orator in the world. It's that they can understand and apply the Word of God to others. But all the rest of the list of requirements for someone to lead a local church are character related. Go read through it. They're to have self control. They're to not, not get into constant fights, but to model Christ for others. That the people who are in leadership in a local church are meant to be those who we could model our life after. 
We could look at them and go, I'm going to live like that to the best of my ability. This is just to tell you a phrase, the random guy on the internet can never be your pastor. He can teach you a lot, but you don't ever get to see that man's life. You don't ever get to see the way the way he sins, he confesses it, and he, and he works on it, and he, and, he, and he apologizes, and he owns it. You won't be able to see the way he prays for others in private, the way he deals with <coughs> suffering, the way he deals with difficult people. The guy on the internet can talk the talk, but you need people in your life who are talking the talk and walking the walk and going, I'm going to follow them even as they follow Christ. And he says, leadership in the church is meant to equip believers to talk the talk and walk the walk. And it's not reserved for people who've gone off to seminary and got a degree or someone who's got a certain position, title in the church. No, maturity is something we should all strive for. And that's actually where Paul closes. The last picture he wants to offer, he says, hey, people, you've got to get along you got to get involved, but he closes that those who are going to mature in their faith are also those who, third, are going to do your part. Are going to do your part. And he gives a couple pictures to sort of finish this out. Look at verse 13. He says, God's given apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He brings the language back to what he said earlier about pursuing greater unity around the knowledge of Jesus. We should be continual learners of God's Word. And that also means we, we should continue to grow and have a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. None of us are going to be perfectly like Christ, but we should continue to pursue that to the best of our ability. Notice he has talking the talk, knowledge of the Son of God, and walking the walk, a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. None of us has arrived this side of heaven so that more for us to pursue in our knowledge and in our life. Each of us has a part to play. There's more to know and there's more to grow into. And he really comes back to two legs of spiritual maturity here, and that is life and doctrine. In fact, Paul would write to the pastor of Ephesus, a young man named Timothy, in the book of 1 Timothy, and he would say, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Watch your talk and your walk because it's dangerous when you lose track of either. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 14. So that we may no longer be tossed, be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceit. Schemes. Here he says spiritual maturity is a mean wishy washy. It's not following after every latest spiritual fad. It's not blowing from one extreme to the other. It's not being easily deceived. It isn't seeking the next emotional high, but it is rock solid, steady, mundane pursuit of Christ. Pastor Eugene Peterson would say it is long obedience in the same direction. Spiritual maturity is steadfastness, not shaking us, and making sure that we are remaining steadfast. Again, notice he's not faulting these new believers for being easily swayed, but he is challenging us and giving a goal to each of us that we might be able to come to the point where we can stand firm in the midst of the winds and the waves that press against us, and that we're to do so together with God's people. You don't have to stand alone. You don't have to grow into this picture of maturity alone. One of the men I consider to be one of my pastors was preaching on this passage. And he said this. He said, you know, they say it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes a church to raise a Christian. It takes all of us working together. The purpose of our community is to help one another to be steadfast and movable 
always abounding in the work of the Lord, that we might grow up together to no longer be children tossed to and fro, that we won't be deceived by every new idea out there, that we would stand as mature people in the knowledge of the Son of God and in the measure of Christ's likeness, that we might be steadfast in our life and in our doctrine. And Paul wants to close by having a real practical picture. How do we do this? Rather than being tossed to and fro, what are we to do? Verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love. We're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in Love. There's the two pegs again. Speak the truth in love. And then, and one without the other is easily tossed Christianity. One without the other is a childish faith, and someone without both is in a very dangerous place. When we give ourselves to speaking the truth to one another and doing so in love, the whole body is built up together. We devote ourselves to making sure that we're pursuing truth and we're exhibiting love together. When each of us is working properly within the body, everyone benefits. Everyone has a role to play, and God is calling you to be a part of the maturity and the benefit of the whole. A.W. Tozer put it this way. He says, social religion is perfected when private religion is purified. In other words, when we get our personal lives together, it's going to overflow for the benefit of the whole. Each of us has a role to play in speaking the truth and in modeling love for others. Each of us has a role to play in telling and showing everyone what it means to follow Christ and to walk with Him. Each of us has a responsibility to show others what maturity looks like. To mature in your faith is to do your part. Let me ask you five questions just for self-examination in closing as we sort of land the plane this morning. First, ask yourself this. Do I belong to a local church? I didn't ask you to attend one. Do you belong to one? Because the New Testament knows nothing of churchless Christianity. All of the commands that Paul has given in this chapter and in the rest of the book are meant to be lived out in a local body of believers. The local church is God's plan for your life and God's design to grow you in maturity. Have you committed to a local body of believers? Whether it's this one or another one. <clears throat> Unless there are special circumstances that prohibit you, the local church is the means by which God would have you pursue maturity. And I would venture to say, if you're not pursuing life in a local body, I don't know how you're doing some of the commands that the Bible would call you to do. How are you bearing with difficult people if you never allow yourself to be around people that are different than you? Do you belong to a local church? Second, ask yourself, how has God gifted me, and how am I using that gift within the body? Don't diminish the grace of God. The ascended Christ has given you a gift of grace. And if you're not using it, you're stifling the gift of God and you're quenching the spirit in your life. How can you use the gifts God has given you to serve others in the body? Let me give you a dangerous prayer this week. To pray and ask God that he would show you your gift and give you opportunities to use it. That's one of those dangerous prayers because God's going to answer that one. We've got to be ready to step into it. Third, ask yourself, do I consider myself a minister? Because our church will grow into everything that God would have for it to be when every member of the body sees itself as a minister to every other person in the body. Every gift has its purpose. Every person has its place. All united together with the same goal of making much of Jesus and becoming more like Jesus. Do you know that you're an ambassador of Christ? So that even outside of here, how you live and what you speak tells others about who he is. And you're a minister of Christ wherever you go. And to pour truth into others and model a life of love for others. When people 
picture a Christian in their minds do they see a picture of you? Fourth, ask yourself, do I speak the truth in love? Some of us are great on the truth parts and terrible on the love parts. Some of us are great on the love part and terrible on the truth part. Because love is empty if it's not married to truth. But truth is often powerless if it's void of love. So maybe love looks like having that hard conversation with someone in your life that you're putting off. Maybe it means that person that really irks you. It means actually praying for them this week. Would we say that our lives are marked by truth and love? And if not, what are we going to do to change it? And do we love our lost neighbors enough to speak the truth to them in light of the fact that apart from Christ, they will head into a Christless eternity? Do we care enough to speak the truth and love to them? And fifth and finally, just ask yourself, am I content with where I am? Because if the answer is absolutely yes, in every area of your life and faith, then is it possible we've forgotten that God's purpose in our life is to be constantly growing? Your purpose isn't done until you've got perfect knowledge of Christ, until you've reached mature manhood, and you have a full measure of the fullness of Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm not there yet. So even if everything might be well with you and you're maturing and you're growing personally, God desires that you might be filled in order to overflow with the lives of others. God would ask you to consider taking the next step of your faith. Maybe that's uniting with a local body in order to live out this picture of maturity together. Maybe it means maturing another, or mentoring another person in this body toward maturity. Maybe it's stepping out and beginning to use your gifts in a way to serve others in our body. It might even mean being challenged to grow in an area of knowledge or in an area of our life that needs adjustment. Regardless, wherever you find yourself today, even if you find yourself lost, friends, the ascended Christ stands ready today to give you grace. If you come to him, he's ready to receive you. Let's stand and let's respond to God's word together. <laughs> Because Jesus did not leave and die and rise again for us to remain babies in the faith. But rather, he promises to forgive us, to fill us, and to empower us to fulfill this mission and this picture together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the local church. We're thankful that you haven't called us to walk in life alone. But Lord, rather, you've put people around us, leadership in the church, you've put other mature believers around us to help us walk in to follow you. Help each of us to fulfill your vision for community, to speak the truth and love, and to walk in such a way that we would set an example for others. Father in heaven, we need your grace not only to give us gifts, but to, we need your grace to recognize those gifts and to put them to work. Fill us, empower us, and use us for your glory. And in these next moments, as we respond, whatever we need to do, be honored and glorified in our time together. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.